This is Chapter 3 of Blood on the River. The 5th of January, 1607. We anchored in the Downs, but the winds continued contrary so long that we were forced to stay there some time, where we suffered great storms. Master George Percy, Observations. I rub my eyes and blink in the dim light of the tween deck. The ship pitches and rolls. I only know it's morning because of the bit of light that peeks in around the gun ports and the closed hatch, and because the roosters and hens down in the hold know, and they've started a racket. The tween deck reminds me of the root cellar at the orphanage with its close walls and ceiling. It's one long room running almost the length of the ship, though one can hardly walk for the barrels and crates that are taking up most of the room. At first, a few of the gentlemen hung pieces of cloth to make partitions, since they thought they deserved some privacy, but those have all come down now in favor of setting up crates as card tables and barrels as sitting stools for their card games. The chickens are luckier than we are. Most days their crates are brought up on deck and they get fresh air to breathe. And the ship's cats and two dogs have the run of the place. So do the ship's 1,000 rats. We passengers are only allowed up to empty slop buckets or get the stew pots for our meals. Captain Newport says he doesn't want us getting in the sailor's way up on deck. We are all seasick and bored, and we are going absolutely no place. We've had nothing but storms and winds blowing the wrong direction for weeks now, and so we sit anchored in the cold, close enough to see England's shores, but still strapped down in this hole of a tween deck with the stench of urine and vomit and chicken dung. The gentlemen complain constantly, they want to sail back to shore and go home. Sir Edward Maria Wingfield is the most vocal in his complaints. He's furious at Captain Smith, who keeps reminding the gentlemen that they have signed seven-year contracts with the Virginia Company, and they can't quit this voyage. I can see why Master Wingfield wants to quit. Even living on the streets was better than this. Next to me, sleeping in our bed, a straw and canvas mattress thrown over some barrels, are Richard and snot-nosed nine-year-old James. James is servant to the gentleman George Percy and afraid of everything. The men sleep two to a bed, but all three of us boys are crowded in together. There is a fourth boy, Nathaniel. He's older than I am, probably 13 or 14. It's a good thing he's on one of the other ships or they'd have us sleeping four to a bed. I kick James to wake him. Give me some room, you little worm. James groans and rolls over. He leaves a smudge of snot on the canvas. I'm not a worm, he whines sleepily. Everyone is waking up now. I hear yawning, grunting, men relieving themselves in the slop buckets. James, bring me my wash water, now. Master Percy is not a patient man, and James has to hop to fetch water even before he has a chance to rub the sleep out of his eyes. Richard is still sleeping. He is the soundest sleeper I have ever seen. Not even roosters crowing and men clomping right by his ear wake him. But Reverend Hunt is very ill with the seasickness and he will need help. I jostle Richard hard. He groans but doesn't open his eyes. Fine, I think. Let him go get a lecture on slothfulness from Reverend Hunt. James and Richard have become good friends to each other, even though James is a gentleman's son and Richard is a commoner. They are not my friends, though. I've kept my distance from them and from everyone else on board, the Susan Constant. Instead of trying to decipher which of the men are to be trusted and which are not, I've made it simple for myself. Trust no one. It's a philosophy that worked for me in the poorhouse, on the streets of London, and at the orphanage. I see no reason to change. Captain Smith has not beat me yet. He does not seem inclined to, but you never can tell. There's not much required of me aboard ship, just to bring him his wash water in the morning and empty the slop buckets we all use. There's not much for any of us to do, and that's why there's so much time for the bubbling up of discontent. And today is the day it boils over. I have had enough, Master Wingfield announces. The food is monotonous and salty. The commoners stink, and the storms will not cease. We will sail back to London at once. Who's with me? I several of the gentlemen call out. We are with you. We're ready to turn back. Captain Smith stands and addresses them. Are you all cowards? He demands. 
And are you liars? Were you lying when you signed your contracts with the Virginia company? I cringe. Captain Smith is especially angry today, and I know he has gone too far. I've seen how these gentlemen wield their power when they are insulted. Master Wingfield answers Captain Smith in a low growl. You have forgotten your place, Mr. Smith. They should never have sent you gentlemen on this voyage, Captain Smith nearly shouts it. You're all weak, every one of you. You know nothing about survival. Master Wingfield is livid. I think he's about to thrash Captain Smith. I would like to see a fight, but Reverend Hunt steps in. Sick as he is, Reverend Hunt calms Master Wingfield down and talks about how God wants us to bring Christianity to the new world. He somehow makes a fragile peace, somehow convinces the gentleman to wait just a little longer for an east wind. But I know there is no peace inside Master Wingfield. I know it is only a matter of time before he strikes. It will not be with his fists, as we commoners do. It will be with his power, and it will be worse than fists. Mm. That was an interesting chapter. That was a build up to what's going to happen next. Um, my discussion question for that chapter is it ended with Samuel saying that he thought that Master Wingfield was going to use his power to do something, which was worse than using fists. What do you think that means? How can power be worse than a physical confrontation? All right, thanks for listening.